Vagujika Kalsa, Vagujiki Fateh. Thank you for joining today's webinar hosted by the Sikh Research Institute. My name is Manvinder Kaur. This webinar will begin with a 50 minute moderated discussion between our presenters, after which we will have 40 minutes of Q&A from the audience. So please drop your questions in the Q&A box and be sure to include your name and city. Now, I would like to introduce you to today's presenters. Firstly, we have Balraj Singh Mann. He is the chairman and CEO of BM Group International, BMG. Starting from lower mainland BC, Canada, BMG has expanded operations into other parts of Canada, the United States, and India, and provides specialty construction, construction material supplies, and real estate development services. Balraj currently lives on his heart, on his a hobby farm in Langley, BC with his mother, wife, two daughters, and son. Our moderator for today is Inikor. Inikor is a educator, author, poet, artist, and currently serves as the Sikh Research Institute's creative director. Jaswinder Singh Jadda uh, is the founder and CEO of Axtria, a data analytics company based in New Jersey and India. Prior to founding Axtria, Jaswinder Singh was the founder and CEO of Market RX, <clears throat> a life science analytics company. He is the winner of the ENY Entrepreneur of the Year Award, Top 40 Under 40 by NJ Biz Magazine and Pharma Voice 100. He is an active angel investor and currently serves as the chair of the board for the Sikh Research Institute. And lastly, we have Farmjithkar Mataru. Uh, she is a managing director at JP Morgan Chase Bank and is the head of tax for the European, Middle Eastern and African region, as well as being the global head for indirect taxes for the firm. From 2011 to 2013, Barmjeet was an executive member of the Sikh Council UK and chaired the European and International Affairs Subcommittee. She's the CEO of Sikh Assembly, a newly founded Sikh organization looking to grow the profile of Sikhs in the UK. Uh, through welfare associated programs. She lives in the UK with her husband and three sons. Please welcome our presenters. What a joy to be with all three of you. It's uh, in some capacity, I have known all three of you. So it's wonderful from the from UK, Paramjit, from Jaswinder Singh Ji, from New Jersey, Balraj Ji. From somewhere in Canada, you tell me that you are right now in a hotel room overlooking some beautiful waters. And I am envious, envious, envious. But um, thank you for taking the time to join uh, us this uh, afternoon for and this morning for this conversation. Um, this is a different one for me because I'm not more business inclined, but there has been something which I have been noticing and have been, you know, following closely. My favorite paper is the journal. So it seems to be a shift, you know, for the last 50 years or so, corporations and Wall Street have subscribed to this theory that businesses the primary reason of a business is to make profit, and which of course it is. But there seems to be a shift. There seems to be a shift in the thinking that corporations and businesses need to do more than that. They need to be sustainable. They need to be good citizens. They need to be purpose-driven. And um, they need to do so more so in the social aspect of life. So the question then becomes, are these goals in conflict with the profit motive, which is driving all corporations and businesses and must? So I ask this question to three of you because you are leaders in your organizations that shape culture, that shape this part of the business. So what have your experiences been in the last maybe even 10 years? Uh, Relating particularly to this shift, how do you see it? How have you navigated it? Um, if you could speak to that, I'd uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And that could be the framework of this conversation. We we'll, we'll go into you know what the values of of Ben Siki are, but primarily let's set the stage of the shift uh, because I believe it's paramount. Um, so. 
Who would like to go first? <laughs> I'm happy to. Sure. Uh, you, uh, everyone. Um, I think that's a really insightful question, Imiji. Um, I think in the time that I've been with, I've actually been with the same organization for about 24 years now. And I would say I noticed that the shift started happening probably a couple of decades ago as we started to talk a lot more about inclusion and diversity. But I think the philanthropy side of it, the, the social well-being, leading to volunteer, uh, to be engaged in local communities, um, and this is a kind of a worldwide phenomena. I think the shareholders themselves passed a message of it's not good enough just to be profitable. It has to be meaningful growth and a legacy for communities. And I think for, for global businesses like ours, it's kind of taken root through uh, sort of large scale philanthropy, like in the sort of instances of rebuilding Detroit, let's say. And then the smaller localized initiatives where partner with local schools, volunteer your time, where the company makes time for you to volunteer into that kind of activity so you can coach children. So I think the drive, funnily enough, has come largely from shareholders and from the operating committee of a large company like mine. And I think it's it's a mark of perhaps that social side, even, even though we see so much capitalism and materialism and we see the, the that side of life, there has been a reawakening of there's more to this and those who can help should. I don't know if that's, um, that, that's a similar experience to, to yours, Paul Raj Singh. Yes. Uh... For me, I've been both sides, uh, starting my career working in consulting for a multinational company and I went through several acquisitions and uh, with uh, like thousands, tens of thousands of employees. So I knew every time the company got acquired, the culture changed. And uh, I always had it in my uh, sort of heart how I would run my organization and when I had a, the opportunity. And then later on, when I started a business, I was very aware of things that I wouldn't do, right? So and uh, now with the father of three millennial kids, I know what their priorities are, right? Raising them and they sort of studied in US and Canada. So I think I have uh, sort of hands-on experience. And in our business is uh, construction, whatever, labor, it's all uh, manpower uh, related. And if in order to grow our, uh, your business, you have to attract and keep talent and you have to listen to people. And I've certainly, over the last three, four decades, change, uh, seen the change and uh, uh, this uh, webinar and whatever the topic we are talking about is so timely and uh, I, I believe in, in this community engagement. So let, so let me jump, jump in. Um, so, you know, uh, I think excellent points. So when we look at the uh, the you know going beyond capitalism or actually uh, creating businesses for the sake of profits, I believe that um, you know this um, a greater purpose of uh, what you do in your community, what you do uh, for uh, for your country, has always been there. It's just that actually when you get off at scale, when you're consuming a lot more resources, uh, you know at scale. Uh, you actually start thinking about is how am I going to actually make this sustainable? Uh, so that actually has played a part as well. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously the businesses and the industries that are driven largely by resources, whatever the resources, natural resources, uh, that they, they have always kind of been on the forefront of actually replenishing them because they know eventually they're going to have an impact on their businesses. A, a business like ours, which is actually based on human resources, our resources of the people, uh, it uh, uh, you know uh, we are more centered around what makes sense uh, for both the business as well as those people. And what we have the trend that Niji is talking about is actually the trend of the the new generation where uh, they need they have a more urge to have clarity in purpose. And, uh, and 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 what most businesses are realizing is that in order for them to be engaged and being excited about what they do for your business, uh, there has to be a clarity of purpose, and the purpose can't just be money. Uh, even though you know this money is important, but it, the purpose is more important. And actually, when you start thinking from that, uh, it becomes a win-win for both the business and the people who work for you. 
So from what I'm gathering, Jessica, you're saying is the shift has been the corporations need to be purpose driven and convey that to their employees, convey that to their communities, and then you you build this kind of bond. Is that Pranjit, is that what I got from you too? Yeah. And yes. Balraji said similar thing. Yes, similar, yes. Yes. And I yeah. think just on something uh, really quite important. So a couple of years ago, I was at one of the sort of leadership conferences that the company holds, and they had invited uh, a millennial to come and talk to what was a room full of, frankly, middle-aged white faces and then the odd one like mine. And they were talking about how, how to manage the workforce for the future. So where a lot of the people who are joining the company are millennials or Gen Z or X or Y, whichever one it is now, and you know, it's it's getting to the to the point that uh, Jesse Bradley just said. Uh, our young people, fortunately, want more than just money. So when you ask them what are the factors that that make you pick the company you want to work for, where do you want to spend your life, apart from obviously the the, the, the normal uh, things that one looks for in terms of stability and career choice. Most of them seem to pick companies where they feel the sense of purpose, the vision, equality, mm -hmm. diversity. What are you actually doing about those things? So I think that's where the pressure has come on the shareholders and on the operating committees of large companies like mine. But I think going back to the entrepreneurial side, just talking to people around me and again within family where we have similar um, small and large scale businesses, um, every business thrives on the assets and the assets are the children of the future and so i think there is that um sense of uh, greater social justice that is required um, i do think that some of the movements that we're seeing around greater social justice um they they are there in our faces in our eyes much more eloquently than they were perhaps 20 years ago and i think we are we all uh, individually and collectively have to uh, acknowledge that where there are inequalities or where there is uh, a lack of uh, social cohesion or equality, then that purpose of bringing uh, the broader community up, not just not just yourself and your shareholder, is an important uh, visionary point. So then what are the things, what are the values that drive you, your companies or your businesses? If you could you know, speak to that. What is the, and let's see if there is a common theme that comes out of it. What is, and you know, we don't need to list everything, but the top maybe four or five, which are the core of your companies and your businesses is something that you, you adhere to very, very strongly. It's not something, and you drill that in into virtually as soon as an employee or somebody joins the company, these are the five things that we would we adhere to. These are our values. So speak to that. What is that? And let's see if there is, you know, in, in different, you, you know, you're in different businesses and you're in different countries. Let's see if there's something in common. Uh, just so, as you. So, yeah, so let me just uh, start off with then. So look, uh, the point that we were discussing earlier, I mean, in some ways from Sikhi is basically, this is the whole concept of Sarbanta Pala, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that you're not only doing it for your own good, but you're doing it for everyone else's good as well. I think from, uh, and uh, uh, Raji talked about the, you know, the he had a vision on the culture that he wanted to have. And the culture in any business is actually driven by the values. And very often those values, especially if they're entrepreneurial businesses actually come from the personal beliefs and the values of the founders and the entrepreneur themselves. And, uh, you know, so when you look at from the, from the Sikhi angle, uh, uh, and, you know, there is a, whether you look at all this kind of the social uh, uh, agitation that is going on in the world today, is the most prominent of them is the, the Black, Black Lives Matter. Ultimately, when you look at that, that actually applies to every business as well. And that is that, you know, this whole concept of one um, uh, and, you know, uh, that uh, and uh, when you start kind of peeling the onion saying, you know, whether treat everyone with respect, everyone with fairness, everyone is equal, uh, you know, so this is, where, this is where the gender equality comes in as well. And, uh, and, you know, and when you zoom out and you, you know, without getting into the details about, you know, who sex are, 
And what are the core values of the six? And you know, everyone will tell you six are you know are 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 hardworking. They have high integrity. They, they, you can you can trust them. And I think what most um, uh, Sikh businesses uh, or uh, leaders who are Sikhs who lead businesses, what they try to bring in is bringing those values. And, uh, you know, so even though things like integrity and hard work are essential, teamwork is essential in every business to succeed. So one of the things that um, uh, at our company where we actually are very proud of a very unique value is that of humility. And, uh, and, you know, again, the humility actually also is very much talked about and, you know, described very well in Sikhi as well. Uh, you know, this is the, uh, you know, um, the man, maniwa uh, part of it and the mat uchi part of it. So uh, those are some of the kind of the so-called the Sikh values that have uh, come into uh, as a core values of the businesses that we are, we are trying to build as well as that then defines the culture of your organization. That that's such an interesting. Uh, I know when we chatted before, just as you, um, I was really struck by the fact that humility is one of the core values that you drive within your business. Uh, being in an investment bank for so long, the word humility isn't the first one that comes to mind in <laughs> values of the company. But it's really interesting because uh, certainly for me, as personally, um, I think the fact that you have to keep one niva matuchi you surround yourself with people who are very talented and then you learn to take the best of everyone and the sum of the parts is bigger than the whole. So one of the things that I have personally journeyed with is uh, you're never great alone. If you carry the tide along, you become a better leader, you become a better partner. And so I was able to start using language like that quite early in my career. So the company's vision is first class business in a first class way. And over the last two decades, they've started to talk about equality, diversity, and they talk about leadership. There is a lot of coaching around what makes a good leader. Um, I know that when I've stood up and said, what do I think about leadership? Uh, I've said that it's accountability. Uh, you know, you can take the knocks, you stand up and be counted, and you partner with humility because it's those things that build the cohesiveness of teams but also allows you to make tough decisions because mm -hmm. I think progress only comes from actually venturing out, taking those risks and then taking the good with the bad and the bad with the good. And I think those qualities of being able to bow when you're wrong and, uh, you know, hold your head high and carry others with you um, and, and always be part of the bigger group because it's never I, it's always we. Yeah. No, absolutely. So, you know, from from another way of uh, uh, looking at this thing, you know, just expounding a little bit more about the uh, about the humility part of it is actually the people who are uh, successful and yet humble. Um, and I have been very fortunate to actually personally know a, a great number of them. Um, so they're all around us, by the way, both in the community as well as the communities that we all live in. And what you find about that is that actually humility comes from your own internal personal strength. Um, you know, and uh, and uh, you know, you mentioned something that uh, you know you don't go out and achieve great things if you don't go and take the risk. Uh, as a matter of fact, there is another thing that actually starts before that, and that is you learn and don't you don't learn anything till you actually make mistakes. And people talk about that all the time. If you just look at someone who actually is humble versus a person who's not humble. And they make the same mistake. The person who is humble is going to learn a lot from that mistake and actually improve themselves versus a person who is not humble. Because if you don't even admit you're making mistakes, uh, you're you're not even uh, you don't have the confidence to go out and actually admit to the world that I've made mistakes. And actually, because you have you're worried about your image and things like that, uh, you're not going to learn from that because you're not going to admit it. Um, so in some ways, the people who have been become great leaders uh, and um, what you find about them is that they, uh, they it's, it starts from their uh, humility uh, to acknowledge that they have made mistakes so that they can learn from it. So Jessie, I'm going to interject a question. So in this world, particularly in the business world where everyone, it's I did it, it's my idea because you know that's where you get the bonuses and that's where you get the, the raises. 
So when you talk about humility in your workplace and business, it's actually contrary to what I'm thinking. How does that happen? Because if you're in a team and whatever else, and it's your great idea and it's, you know, the company has been very successful and has added millions to the, uh, to the bottom line, how does humility play in that? So this is a so this is something that I have personally uh, struggled with, and I think this is also uh, might be a difference between the culture of the West versus the East, um, or you know, and since Sikhi um, kind of originated from the East, we have a lot of those Eastern values as compared to the Western values that are embedded into our psyche and our behavior. Um, I remember uh, speaking at a conference in New York City. Uh, this was for the young uh, Asians for. Uh, working on the Wall Street, and uh, even though I'm neither young nor work on the Wall Street, you know, I was one of the speakers, and one of the person who was the keynote speaker just before me, and literally, you know, I shook his hand and I bent up, is that this person, and I actually talked about addressing the Asian uh, young professionals, is that uh, you know the uh, you need to change your mindset, and uh, you know uh, you have to speak for the work. Don't expect the work to speak for yourself. And uh, and they paid a lot of money for this keynote speaker to go up there, you know, and speak. And and uh, when I got up there and I said I have to uh, I have to apologize. Uh, I have not done research. I don't speak very well. But here's what my experience is. Actually, um, uh, you diminish your own value by actually speaking about your work. Uh, and that is humility. And uh, and and that's where uh, you know, yeah, and then it also comes down to is uh, I can tell you from my personal experience, people who are the strongest and the largest contributors in any team or any company um, are, tend to be humble. Um, they don't go out and go rah rah rah. Um, uh, even though from the outside it looks like it that the people who are successful are the ones who get a lot of limelight, but it's not. It's it's they're not speaking for the work. The work is speaking for them. I think that's that's absolutely right. I think you know that's you speak very well, actually, uh, Jasiji. And I think I was I was going to share a little insight of something that happened to me when I was probably thirty years younger than I am now, and I had just moved from being uh, in Price Waterhouse, which was uh, again a very large corporate, but you're within a team where you're surrounded with colleagues who are doing very much the same work that you're doing, and I just moved into. Uh, industry where I was the the manager for the function in in a in a, in a separate company, uh, not the one that I'm in now. And about six seven months into into my new role, I made a mistake, um, quite a significant mistake. And I, I very clearly remember this that the sense of panic and the sense of fear when you realise you've done something wrong and you're responsible, and your immediate reaction is oh dear. Um, how am I going to tell anybody? You know, you think that, then you think, I'm going to fix this. Uh, okay, I'm going to fix this. Then I'm going to tell somebody and then I'll take the consequences. And so that's what happened. Uh, but the fear, and I, I, I remember calling home saying, uh, I may be out of a job by the end of today because I've done something really stupid, uh, but I've got to do what I've got to do. I'll see you later. And I put the phone down on my husband. And <laughs> I remember going to see the, the CFO of the organization that I worked for and I said, listen, I, I actually had really had a, a mishap here. I just missed something. Uh, this is how I think it needs to be fixed. And it's, it's, I clearly work in a regulated area. So this was a, a mistake that was going to have to be, be put right quite publicly. And, and I said, you'll have my letter at the end of the day, but I just wanted to fix the issue before I did that. And um, he was really amused. Um, so there I was, you know, heart palpitating, really frightened. You do have a fear. Um, and he just turned around and said, why do you think you need to resign? And I said, well, this is going to cost the company. This is quite serious. And it was my responsibility and I blew it. And he said, well, yeah, you did. But everybody does that at some point, And it's best mm -hmm. to have very early in your career. And if you don't step up and don't act and don't embrace challenge, you won't learn that lesson until far further down in your journey. So one of, one of the best lessons I learned from that episode, actually, we carried on and things things were very quickly back to normal. And the problem wasn't as crazy as I thought it was. But I, but I think the journey of um, should one have the courage to reach out for the stars? Yes, absolutely, because we are all, you know, 
mantu jo tsuruta apna mool pachan work hard and work hard means embrace it embrace change go for it and sometimes it's not going to work um and when it doesn't what do you do uh, and i think that's where sikhi says nir for nir var you're doing it with the best intent and if it doesn't work then go talk to someone who can help you and i think those values of humility and humility i think includes that healthy fear you know bad they bow mm. and we with our our kalpur you know we our relationship with, with with our own you know nickname is the great leveler every day <laughs> it brings you back to that base but whatever mm. you do you've got to do it with conviction and with integrity and honesty the consequences will take care you know the work will take care of itself and you will rise or fall based on how you conduct yourself so roger you've been very silent you've been listening yes, absorbing yeah. we'd love to hear your thoughts <laughs> yeah i think so uh, so many wise things been said but i think um, i just like to uh, add on the humility part i think humility gives you inner strength and also in our organization like ours uh, there's a diverse uh, a uh, sort of a, a group of people some are sort of day laborers and some are manager executives so you want to make everybody you feel a, a part of the team right so you, this is where the leadership and the uh, comes in how you lead by example and not uh, sort of try to make sure that the team value and all those things are up front so everybody uh, feel that they are contributing equally and you have to lead by example also in in a matter of uh, wherever you are that you treat them fairly whether equal um, value pay for for equal work because i have uh, uh, two daughters so the, i i can feel how growing up whether they was getting admissions or in, in their careers how what they would be feeling so uh, i need to uh, make sure that uh, my staff feels that they are getting a sort of fair treatment and think and uh, just be a sort of a humble and just observe and uh, and talk to the people at all levels right they make them uh, connected and this is where uh, also the sikhi of faith uh, comes in at times when you have challenges uh, in my uh, uh, lifetime i've seen three different recessions right so you come out strong if you don't have challenges in life and uh, you don't learn you don't develop those skills right so and uh, but having some a faith in your background or uh, our childhood how we were sort of um uh, told all those sakis and whatever i think those things do help right so i think uh, sick and sick values uh, help you in, in a business world along uh, in those sort of terms as well so going from there balraji you mentioned something that listening to the sakis and the faith helps you so what have so i'm going to ask the quiz question what has your faith and your early life experiences how has that shaped your professional life and reflected in your leadership styles because you know we are products of what we listen to we absorb osmosisly as ch- we don't even know we are absorbing things it's mm-hmm. only when we are confronted with certain situations that somewhere deep embedded within us is a memory that comes up and says you know that's that voice where am i getting that so if you could speak to that what is it in your early experiences or in your faith or something else that has triggered or has been monumental in shaping or forming your leadership style i think um, i come from a family of farmers and my family moved from uh, pakistan faisalabad to to india at partition time and they build their own uh, new life in in india punjab now right so we are farmers you get up early in the morning and you have a lot of farm help and how my family was treating um, the others uh, people in in the farm and also earlier on um, there were no uh, things were tight economically and also the other challenges uh, culturally there was a caste system and other things right so how my parents treated the the people around them that has a big influence on that uh, on my life and also whether it's um, crop and you sort of see your father giving a first uh, uh, sort of a, uh, whatever you can sharing the, the first thing goes to the gurdwara uh, uh, we are close to anandpur sahab so so they would bring a truck and the first uh, bushel of wheat goes to donation and working hard and sharing kirt karna vand ki shagna i think those sort of principles started uh, earlier on in my life and uh, 
when I have the opportunity now and starting my business, I sort of try to live up uh, with the same, same sort of uh, uh, sort of principles and uh, those are the things that guided me um, later on in my life, just following the footsteps of, of my uh, parents, how they shaped their life and then they raised a, a large family with the minimum uh, resources and I try to make sure that I provide wherever I can. So if I could just jump in, uh, your question about, um, you know, what do you learn from the Sakis or other things about Sikhi? Um, you know, um, so, you know, uh, every every faith, you know, there is there is the spiritual and the faith angle of it. And then there is a uh, in our uh, in our um, case, as six, that is there. But also the other part is the, you know, the the the, the leadership uh, and the uh, values of the gurus um so in sikhi i have always kind of gotten a lot more on the values and the and the leadership part of it i've struggled on the faith part of it personally and uh, on but you know from uh, from the from the values and all when you look at some of the things that our gurus were able to do uh, i mean they you know we don't believe in miracles and uh, none of them uh, really i mean they did it the from from the from the first principles you know uh, first is to have the vision then you need to have uh, a strategy you need to have a plan and then you go out and actually put systems and processes and go out and execute that and uh, and 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 that is uh, and that that is what leaders do and uh, you know uh, and and often time if you look at it I'm, and I'm an entrepreneur you know what they teach you in entrepreneurship is that you know you go out and actually accomplish your 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 goals in spite of the resources that are given to you and uh, in some ways if you look at it i mean that that inspiration if you look at what some of uh, you know the the stories we hear about our gurus um it was about that i mean they, you know they they never really had um uh, unlimited resources uh, but uh, you know that never really kind of uh, uh, held them back so to speak uh, and when you and i and i and uh, and I try to bring that same mindset to the uh, to to the business uh, as that we're, we're not afraid of the big players that big software companies or tech services companies who we compete with. We are better than everyone else. Uh, but just believing in that is not enough. You've got to invest in uh, in in planning and 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 systems and processes. Uh, and uh, going out and actually then going out and achieving that. And of course, along the way, you're going to have failures. But as long as net net your successes are more than the failures, you're going to come out. Um, uh, you're you're going to come out uh, ahead. Uh, one other aspect of this thing is actually learning. And uh, even though we call ourselves, uh, you know, six, and we're supposed to believe in, you know, the kind of the the learning part of it. That's what you know, uh, Sikhi is. Um, I, most people actually stop learning. Um, uh, pretty early in their life, by the way. Um, most of us believe that once you, you know, go to school or college, you know, the, life, the learning part is over. Now it's the practice part of it. And uh, but that's not what Sikhi is. Sikhi is lifelong learning. And how do you actually bring that lifelong learning in your business? Um, uh, and 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 I'm absolutely amazed with the uh, the the ability of uh, the gurus. Uh, to go out and learn, uh, learn uh, new languages, uh, to so that they can actually have the interactions with the with, with the locals, uh, and I mean that they that li that lifelong learning continued uh, again. So there are a lot of different aspects of Sikhi that actually play a part in our in our lives, and sometimes we may not even uh, no. be able to articulate that. True, true. Pramji, thoughts. Yes, I was just reflecting back as I was listening to both Balraj and, and uh, Jasiti. And I think uh, as the youngest of five daughters, um, my parents, um, my, my, my father was quite young when he emigrated to Kenya. And we were very much working style. Uh, my father was employed, self-employed, he was self-taught. And um, yeah, there was a lot of kind of, I know my mother suffered from the, oh dear, so many daughters syndrome. Uh, my father just looked at everybody like, who's counting? 
Um, and so we grew up very much uh, more equal than anyone else. And I know that the opportunities, uh, certainly when I when I did my A levels in, in the UK in in, in Kenya. Um, I went to uh, one of the schools that was actually a boys' school up until the A-level stream. And there was a lot of family pressure to say, you know, oh, you know, 2,000 boys, 30 girls, is this the right thing to do? There was that kind of cultural pressure. But the family that I, I was very lucky to be in, you know, uh, the, the daily nickname, the re reading the Janamsaki with my dad at age 14, understanding the role of women and how Sikh gurus have put women into such a position of not just equal but equitable and mm. above that and you know that just builds your inner confidence that you're no different so uh, one of the things that I've I've found because for all sorts of reasons I in the end didn't go to university and ended up catapulted into a career that just happened I didn't choose it and one of the first things that um, was, was quite, other people noted to me that I'm actually very short, I'm four foot ten, I'm female, I don't look the rest, like the rest of the people. Most places where I go, it's usually largely male, largely white, and largely two foot taller than me. <laughs> Exaggerate. Um, so what did I learn from the Sakya? That we don't get intimidated that actually you have to have that inner confidence in yourself. And you're not thinking about yourself, you're thinking about what you're doing. And when I sometimes cast my mind back, where did the strength come from? Well, it comes from the Sakya. It comes from the very early childhood um, strength of moral compass and self-belief in, in this context that you're not alone. You're never really alone. If you believe that your inner strength comes from uh, the divine, then it's it's uh, one of the things that draws me to Sikri because we talk about the force, we talk about the one, or well, who is that? It's all of us. So why fear anyone? Why fear a situation? Just get on with it. And I think that's that was to me has been an abiding um, principle that that I learned at my father, my mother's knee. So Jessica, you talked a lot about your corporation. You know, you worked. You're that you're an entrepreneur. So at what stage in your life did you decide to do become an entrepreneur? And what does it take? And what advice would you give to the people out there who are saying, who are debating? Because I know Balraji also went, he said he was working for someone that he's begun his own. So yeah. what is that? You know, there comes a point when you say, okay, enough of this and I'm going there. But it is a challenge. So can you speak to that? So I can uh, speak about my personal uh, experience, which uh, you know may be different than Balraji uh, or you know many of the other entrepreneurs or people who aspire to be entrepreneurs. So um, I actually got inspired to become an entrepreneur uh, when uh, you know I, I come from a family, even though you know before partition, everyone I heard my grandparents they all had businesses and all that. You know, over family, both my mom and father side were displaced from Rawalpindi. And they both ended up being in Dehradun, and that's where they eventually married and got married. Um, and uh, my mom was a teacher, a professor at university, and my father was uh, in in the in the Indian Army. And uh, you know, two trades which basically don't teach you anything about business, by the way. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's a baggage. You have to unlearn a lot of things if you want to succeed uh, in business. And um, you know, I, I I was fortunate enough to actually uh, go to a school uh, in India at IIT Delhi, uh, which has actually been the uh, the most uh, successful university in creating entrepreneurs. As a matter of fact, if you look at uh, the today's unicorns in India, uh, um, you know, more than half of the unicorns of all of India that have been built in the last 30 years have been built by people from IIT Delhi. So this was kind of an ecosystem on a hotbed where, and, and even at that time, you don't realize that this is what you're imbibing. You're just learning, you see that. And I, I came to US for uh, for education uh, from a master's and ended up doing a PhD. And there uh, I went to school in Texas and you know uh, uh, the role models that uh, 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 they were there at that time, You know this is, 25, 30 years ago, you know, uh, Michael Dell's of the world or Steve Jobs of the world. I mean, these were technology. I was fascinated by technology. Uh, and there were these role models uh, and so on. So so I was inspired to become an entrepreneur. But for 
to become an entrepreneur or a business, you need to have ideas, you need to have resources, you need to have skills, you need to have, um, you know, all of that. And I have none of that. By the way. Uh, this is just an aspiration. So to answer your question, when I wanted to be an entrepreneur, when I, uh, when I was a student in Texas, um, what did I do? and realized that what I needed, and hindsight is always 2020. I, it sounds very nice that I can tell you a plan, but I'll tell you the things that actually worked for me was that as an engineer and as a technical person, it's actually ability to, uh, it's ability to sell. Um, and, 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 and by the way, selling for people who are engineers and te uh, technical is actually very scary because sales is more about Failures, I mean, you have a lot more failure in sales than you have successes. And as engineers, we are taught not to fail. You know, if you design a system, you're supposed not to fail. Um, you build anything, it's not supposed to fail. So learning how to sell was probably one of the, uh, the most important skills that I had an opportunity to learn very early in my career. And that became one of the biggest, uh, in a way, assets for me. Uh, uh, the second one uh, was, uh, which is linked to sales, is actually um, so. You know, the first one is learn to sell to people you don't know. The second one is to actually hire people who are much smarter than you are, who are happy to work for you. And that, by the way, that by the way is not easy um, because if they're smarter than you, why would they be happy to work for you? They're gonna go do it themselves. And that is the second part of it. So when young entrepreneurs come and ask me and saying, you know, I want to be an entrepreneur, I only ask them saying, you don't need to convince me that you are a good entrepreneur. Convince yourself. Have you sold to people you don't know? And have you hired people smarter than you who are happy to help, to to work for you? And if you have not proven that to yourself in the current job or whatever you're doing, try to pivot yourself to go get that experience and prove it to yourself. Once you have proven to yourself, you can actually go and become an entrepreneur. Well, I mean, that the second part that to be comfortable to hire people who are smarter than you and then to work with them, that requires a lot of inner growth. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. This is where actually most of the people insecurities get in the way. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, this again gets tied to the humility part of it, right? Uh, right. The inner strength is comes from uh, uh, you know the humility comes from the inner strength. Mm. You know what that helps you to think about, I and mean, I, I so agree with you because if you surround yourself with talent, right, bigger, better talent than yourself, it it is a sign of strength. But it makes everything stronger. You think about succession. You think about growth. Uh, you allow people. Sometimes people are really, really clever. They can't think with vision. But when very, very clever people come together, they collectively start to create visions. Yeah. And that lets them all grow together. Um, and I found that even though I'm, I'm not an entrepreneur in the same way as Baji is, but obviously having built teams from scratch and then built functions from, from very small scale to global scale, it is that the first building block is to find the talent. And that talent inevitably is going to be smarter than you because that sum of parts making the bigger mm -hmm. whole is that drives growth uh, and that's both personal growth and clearly in, in our jobs it's it's the, the the growth of the organization yeah 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 and and again there there there, there is a you know there are enough examples in our our our, our sick history uh, where um, you know uh, guru sahibs did that and there is a lot of history even in uh, in the court of maharaja ranjit singh where uh, you know, uh, he was very comfortable uh -huh. actually hiring the best talent from all over the world in his court, uh, irrespective of their gender or ethnicity, uh, to come in and actually play that role. And that's what made him the, you know, one of the strongest um, rulers of uh, and of, you know, uh, for for a long period of time. Uh, that's as, uh, that that will be my. Uh, that's how I, would, I share my experience. Uh, about my journey in entrepreneurship. So Paramjit, if, 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 what advice would you give the young graduates out there in this current situation? Yeah, and I think, so Bill, what we've just been talking about, you know, the, the kids of today as they go into the future, um, I think the biggest skill is learning how to manage change 
learning how to deal with failure, uh, learning to embrace opportunity. So it doesn't actually matter which particular degree course people want to go for, which uh, internship they're going to go for, which vocation they're going to follow, because there, you know, your, your passion for what you're interested in, whether it's mechanics or whether it's architecture or it's tax or whatever, you know, that, that core skill set you need. But above and beyond that, one has to be able to deal with how to manage change, how to embrace change, how to bring other people on the journey with you. So the biggest piece of career advice I, I give to people who talk to me is just just being introverted and thinking, this is it, this is the box I'm going to put myself into, is probably self-limiting and probably not equipping you for the future. I think one has to be able to say, I'm never going to be in one little box. I have to learn and I have to live with change and strive for success through things I don't necessarily understand because you have to keep your mind open to learn. So I think first first thing is you have to have a, a passion for learning. So choose the subjects you enjoy and then look for areas where you can work with bright and talented people. So think about your growth and other people's growth. But but for me, the biggest thing is understand that changing and managing change is one of the biggest skill sets for the future. I don't know, Barad Singh, was, does that make sense in your way? Yes, and also I'd like to add one thing. is There's a lot of young people, they're talented, they're a lot more... Uh, educated and um, informative about their careers and all those things because of the technology one thing uh, i would say is patience because they think the one thing they don't have is when they enter workforce is uh, uh, experience of life right and how to get along with other human beings other colleagues because some of them they could be at the jobs uh, 30 years uh, um, earlier and uh, they're older they may not have the education or credential but they have the experience some of the young people, are, they want everything like yesterday. I think those are the things, just, just patience and humility goes a long way from learning and other people guiding you the way. If you're not, uh, if you're going to have um, uh, ego and uh, attitude, I think you, people won't get uh, too much support uh, from their colleagues. I think that's uh, one thing I would I would uh, advise the younger people. Just, just uh, give it some time and find your footing and uh, sort of, just, uh, I think, just work hard. I think that uh, there's no replacement for that. You know, Balraji, in your <clears throat> line of business, you have your day labor, your construction workers, <clears throat> and then you have your senior executives. I mean, it's quite a broad span of people. How do you make sure that the decisions that you um, implement are equitable across the board. What is it that drives you? What is that one principle that drives you to make sure that that is fair? <clears throat> I think I, a lot of times I tell stories when I first came to um, BC I and mean, maybe we are uh, uh, because we come from farming background and we all of us uh, growing up uh, uh, as teenagers in, in, in BC, we worked in the farm summertime and uh, then we went on to get some education. So I tell my story. So there's no shame in doing um, entry level jobs. And uh, I was given the opportunity by others uh, because they saw my work ethics. So I do the same. And if in my organization there's any opportunity, I invest in people, uh, right people. And I sort of invest a lot in uh, professional development. And if I have, I give my first priority to people within the organization. If I can see, uh, people growing from, um, I have a, uh, in my general manager who grew from uh, labor, now they're managing big companies successfully, just they've built that reputation or their own brand within a brand of uh, looking after their, their colleagues and, and the, the clients. So I think for me, I have uh, a sort of a lot of uh, sort of passion for developing people, leaders within the organization. And uh, I think that's uh, it goes a long way and other people also see that this is a people ahead of uh, them that's how they build their career so it's it's a, a good motivation for everybody uh, to to take that path yeah that's <clears throat> jesse G, you hire people yes. so what what drives you to make sure that the equity is there gender equity and you know that's where i'm going with you is that to make sure 
that uh, you, in your role, where you have direct authority, you know, what drives you to make sure that the gender is represented? <clears throat> so, to be very honest with you, this is a huge challenge. And um, I'll probably get in trouble for that as the same way the CEO of Wells Fargo actually got in trouble this week. Uh, and it's not about, but I'm not going to say that it's the talent is not available. So there are two things. One is where, what is the source and how do you procure it? Um, so the resources that are available. So the people that we hire, these are um, uh, all uh, STEM graduates. So science, technology, engineering, math. And uh, and we hire from the you know the top schools in both US and in India, uh, so that is the talent pool. When you look at the STEM graduates, uh, uh, fresh graduates, I'm talking about, uh, you look at the STEM graduates. The the most of the schools are from uh, the, the 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 women uh, participation is between 10 to 30 percent of the graduating class. Um, it's even though it's it, and and this is amazing. Um, and you know, in in US, uh, more than uh, sixty percent of the high school valedictorians are girls, and yet the representation of uh, of girls in colleges is actually in STEM is very very low. Uh, so there's this kind of the selection bias, so to speak. Uh, from the company's perspective, this is how what we procure is that our um, uh, uh, for the, our recruiting team, uh, we actually give them a specific target uh, and encourage them to get as close as possible to 50%. Uh, over the last few years, uh, we have succeeded to get to about 40%. We're, so that's why I said it's a, still a struggle, but it's still significantly more than the source that is available uh, uh, from, from the talent perspective. Paramjit, your thoughts? Yeah, it's just, again, reflecting on uh, the work that's been going on around uh, gender inclusion and, and building that diversity of talent. And it's it's interesting because the intake, um, the graduate intake levels are more or less 50-50 uh, along most of the, the large institutions in the city. But what tends to become, um, and I think this is a bit of a trend in most organisations, that by the time you get to sort of a manager grade, a senior manager grade, the percentage of women seems to drop down. And so a lot of the work that we've been doing has been very much focused on why. So the leaving interviews, exit interviews and, and polling that goes on is to try and work out well, why do people leave? And one of the, the things is around is the workplace conducive to the lives that young women need to lead. They're going to be the creators. They're going to have families. They're going to have to nurture the families. Inevitably, childcare tends, to, in the past, has been largely a female domain. Thankfully, it's starting to become a little bit more balanced. Uh, but I think this is where investing, so I think leaving aside the, the issue that just sort of thing is very clearly laid out, that the if, if you don't have the right numbers coming out of the grad schools in the first place, then you're starting in a different spot. But I think with us having, within my profession, we have a broader, uh, we're not just going for STEM, we're going for broader uh, intake, then you do have a broader balance to start with, but it shakes off. And so that by the time you get to senior manager, certainly by the time you get to MD level, you've got a much shrunk pool and so a lot of the work that is happening now is to understand the reasons why and then think about those flexible working arrangements. Think about how perhaps childcare facility, uh, parental leave, you know, all of those support criteria that are needed in, in organisations so that people can continue to, with their careers, albeit in a slightly different way to maybe the usual conventional, what used to be the conventional workday. So I think, um, I mean, I'm, I'm very pleased that um, I've, uh, certainly in my area of work and within my own direct team, um, we actually have a really healthy 50 to 55 percent, it fluctuates, um, um, a percentage of women. But across the firm, you know, the, the statistics are out there. Um, it is an active piece of work. You can't not keep looking at it and wondering why and what can you do to help. So I think investment in women, investment in the children, investing in how... The, the social fabric works because it's those sorts of issues. And of course, the culture. We've talked about the culture of the organization. People remain loyal to 
a company if they feel that they're looked after as an individual. So it's investing in the culture of the companies is an important thing. Right. So I want to take a question here because it's directly to you, Jesse G. So <clears throat> it's, it's, uh, it's from Daljeer Daljinder Singh. Uh, Jesse G, on gender participation, now that you recognize that the female participation stems from the college level and the choices they make, how do you think you, as a large corporation, can lend them support to bring it to a level playing field, especially among sick young ladies? Yeah. So um, no, that, 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 that's, that's an excellent question. Um, it's a... Uh, I can tell you as of, uh, you know, my we have three kids, our eldest um, is, is a daughter and, uh, you know, very proud of her. She's been associated with uh, Sikri for quite some time. She's been to Siddhak and, you know, she's a very proud, she's still in college, but proud to be uh, uh, um, studying engineering. And, uh, and, but she, this is what she want, this is what she wanted to do since middle school. And part of that is that, and she was a little rare in her whole high school uh, to go towards that. So actually it is, uh, uh, this, this whole kind of a selection bias is actually happening at the school level, by the way. Uh, and I can tell you from my own daughter's example, um, actually she was discouraged um, uh, or not strongly encouraged to actually, uh, you know, take the AP courses and, you know, go towards the uh, engineering part of it. Uh, so there is a there is a so this 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 bias is endemic in our society, uh, and I'm talking about U.S. I'm sure other parts of the world are uh, are the same. Uh, the the so what we uh, have done. Uh, so uh, also just a small correction. Um, my company is not a large corporation. So um, we, we we have about two thousand employees, which is medium size, but not a large corporation. So our reach and our resources are still quite limited uh, in terms of what we do. Uh, so this is what we have done. And uh, uh, so we actually uh, uh, sponsor a very specific program um, in India called FFE, FFE.org, which is Foundation for Excellence, uh, started by an amazing entrepreneur, where we actually take care of about 40 to 50 kids and take their complete education from start to begin they focus on mostly on engineering and some on uh, on 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 becoming medical doctors and the means of these people is that you know they are people who are basically uh, taxi drivers or you know uh, day laborers and these are their kids and uh, and the participation in that is actually close to 50 percent um, not sicky but it's basically these are from a very uh, and you know so we are changing uh, lives of 40 to 50 kids at any given time, which will eventually change the lives of the families because you know suddenly they come up and they are uh, becoming engineers. At the local level, uh, we actually uh, run a lot of programs at the high school. Again, this problem is not at the college level, this is actually a high school problem. At the college level where we are essentially coming in and actually showing them the role models. Uh, I, I firmly believe that the reason why our daughter chose to become an engineer is because she was not afraid. You know, my, wife her mother is a is, has a uh, has undergrad in computer science i'm an engineer so she had very strong role models her grandmother was a math professor at a university i think the biggest challenge in the sick community is actually having uh, those role models and making everyone aware that this is all possible um so that's i'll stop there I truly agree with having women role models because, you know, as I go out and I speak at events, the number of women that come to me and said, you know, it's good to see you in this role. And I said, would you like to be in this role? And they said, no, but it's good to see you. <laughs> so it's that, you know, that glass seal, some sort of a ceiling that you're breaking. Paramjit, I'm sure you get that too. I, I do. And, and actually, um, I think over the last decade or so, where I've overcome my own kind of sit in a shell and don't don't talk about what you're doing, I've started to talk a little bit more. And actually, it's got to the point where in the last year, um, I have uh, worked with uh, a dozen or so of uh, very smart professional uh, Sikh colleagues to set up an organization, the Sikh Assembly in the UK. And Part of my motivation is, um, you know, how, how do you build something that you can you can propagate this message and the mentoring, the role modeling, 
So within Sick Assembly, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm leading that organization and mentoring, role modeling, uh, women's issues. So one of one of my uh, colleagues is, uh, she leads the SWAN organization, which is Sick Women's Alliance Network, which deals with a lot of the issues that young women can face within families. So it's it's very, but, but um, interestingly, it's, it's not just sick women, it's broader. So they tackle the tough issues around what stops women succeeding. And that ranges from uh, the cultural restrictions or handicaps, some some cases of really extreme domestic violence or other issues that can happen. So society as a whole, um, you know, the young women need to be able to see the role models that can confront those myths. And whether that is at a cultural level or whether that is within their careers, uh, what I find people ask me most is, because I'm, I'm also, uh, I have uh, three sons and two daughters-in-law now, one little granddaughter. And the, the, the richness of having come this journey, people ask me the question, how can you have had a career and do these things? And, mm. and, and the thing is, we, because people believe if you come from our culture, our Sikhi, that these things are not synonymous. But actually, we're all taught to do Kittakami, Naham Jampana, Vandashakana. And then within our, our families, to grow those families, nurture them, to be the best. So I think that's where um, certainly one of the things that I'm starting to uh, really push for now is, uh, you know, how do you grab the kids who are 14, 16, 25, 30, to give them the courage and and create the role models and the mentors, get, get that pool, like, get, let, let's get the networks up for our, our kids and particularly, um, and I will shamelessly say, I am really focused on the Sikh community at the moment to think about how would our kids hang out with the right um, guidance and mentoring to be able to reach the heights that they all can because you do find some people are withering on the vine and going off into other things and perhaps not getting us to the best um, platform. So I think those those are issues which go to both the gender point, but they go more broadly towards how do we coach and mentor? How do we create the leaders of the future? Um, I mean, some of the, when we were talking about this session, we were talking about the world of COVID, the world generally. How do we make sure our children, our communities are balanced, um, you know, well interlinked with community at large, but happy to carry the flag for our gurus and for ourselves. Be confident being who you are. And I think that's where mentoring and, and picking up uh, strength from, from collective mentoring is something that I feel we need to do more of. So Balranchi, you have girls. Yes, I think my um, uh, daughter chose more career paths in the medical field unrelated to construction, but I do have a uh, nieces who cho chose engineering and uh, those kind of fields um, but construction is a uh, more of a male dominated field but i do have uh, some uh, female workers they sort of uh, they, they show, share their challenges right one of my supervisors she's a sheet metal worker she works she does an amazing job and she tells me story how she was uh, treated on site with the there was no washroom separate and all those other issues uh, in construction site so for it's a high paying job well uh, sort of uh, secure job but people somehow even in the main uh, street community there's very few uh, females sort of elect that uh, career path in the construction on the engineering side in the in our offices now there more and more uh, uh, women especially from latin america others they are coming in entering as estimators or uh, uh, project managers and also in the marketing side of things on the real estate there's there's no issue there's lots of uh, uh, females uh, sort of employees but in construction we are always encouraging because as a part of uh, our initiative is uh, and also for me having uh, two daughters if, if there's opportunity i encourage people that uh, whether it's uh, learning to operate equipment or uh, uh, whatever they want to do is um, right. construction safety or whatever i think um, yeah because uh, I, my experience is positive and i try to encourage as much as i can but there is a definitely a lack of uh, 
uh, role models and uh, whatever because uh, there's not there aren't that many uh, women in in construction right that they can follow all right so i'm going to take a question here so the question is uh, how has covid 19 impacted your business what is your company doing to reduce the carbon footprint and this is from manjeet kaur so um, any thoughts who would like to go first to answer that so i can jump in uh, so uh, so covid we've been living in covid era so to speak for the last 6 months uh, you know the first few months were there was a lot of uncertainty i think we've all kind of settled in in our personal lives and our business world to live with whatever we are doing some people have been impacted we've been very fortunate if you look at even the public markets the uh, uh, there are certain industry sec sectors which have been impacted more than others um, you know obviously if your travel hospitality um or you know uh, food and re restaurants and things like that uh, those have been impacted pretty significantly on the other hand industries whether they are technology or whether they healthcare they have actually uh, uh, done reasonably well uh, we have been very lucky we are on the healthcare and technology side of it so we've been very fortunate on that this is pure luck no one could have architected this thing but having said that uh, i think we're living in a world which is a lot of has a lot of uncertainty uh from our business perspective but also from a people's perspective uh, no one was prepared for this we were not prepared for it um and uh, and you know earlier we were talking about uh, the impact on 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 young women um in there uh, actually the 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 young mothers are the ones who have actually gotten impacted more than anyone else because the daycares are shut down and uh, these are the people who actually still are very active in their careers and now they have to basically do the homeschooling of the kids take care of the kids do the school you know do all of that and you know so even in the young couples with a you know husband and wife it's been very uh, it's been very tough uh, the question is that what is how we're going to do this thing from a long term perspective so right now our view is that we are going to continue the way we are continuing for the next 9 to 12 months um and that is in the best case scenario in this includes several new vaccines coming into the market in the next few months in spite of that actually we will continue the way, way we are for the next 9 to 12 months and that's going to have long term impact on every business and every industry uh, so i'll i'll i'll, I'll stop there and i think for me as well the the, the sector that i'm in um actually because people can work from home that side of it you know the job certainty hasn't been an issue but even there i completely agree with the comment that young moms young families young parents the burden of of self so the schooling the burden of actually having the kids around you while you're trying to work and they're having to juggle their hours all all of that but the other thing that has become very clear is of course people who've got care responsibilities and then if you look at them who are you caring for if if i look at the elders in my family directly you know that entire support structure where they could go into the gurdwara go to a community center go somewhere and now they're shielding and um, over the months the impact of that the impact of that on the families on the young carers in the family those issues are actually quite severe so when you think about the mental impact of how people are juggling their lives their per boundary between personal and business life has got really merged up and some some people are really struggling with that mentally so certainly you know the well-being side of how to care for your staff and how, what can you do so even in industries that aren't hugely impacted certainly from a job certainty perspective the care of the individual has become far more um important to focus in on because you can see the signs of the stress that's building So Balraja you have a global workforce. I mean, yes. Covid has talk about that. What has that done to you to your business? I think for us um, I think there's big lessons and lessons we learned and we are fortunate that uh, we have uh, operations in different parts of the world. Uh BC uh, on impact in on construction was uh, very small like we continued working and building buildings and uh, repairing but uh, us operations seattle uh, portland and india were completely shut down for for several months and the uh, biggest thing like papan uh, ji said earlier is mental health and i made sure that i can sort of interact and stay positive and uh, people worry and we lost one of our young workers in uh, 
um, Portland office. He was going through some marital problems. A young fellow, maybe 30, early 30s. And then COVID hit and he was depressed. And he, I don't know what happened. He lost his life. Uh, and that's, that was a big uh, sort of, uh, sort of shake up uh, for us, right? So I made sure the people are not worried about their paycheck. All our lives we make money, so when one year we make less or no money, it's it's not a big deal. We try to keep everybody on the on the staff on the payroll. Those in the Seattle who office staff who could work uh, from home, they are still working from home. Others uh, on the sites, uh, we told them to use extra caution and don't worry about it. Like it'll uh, pass, and so you you share stories of the past ups and downs. I think. Uh, that's been important and having, um, like I said, operations in different places has helped and different type of business, a little bit diversity has been good for us. It's a good lesson learned that uh, we can sort of build on that. I think the main thing is stay positive and uh, people around you and a lot of, it's not easy to work from home either. Like we are a, uh, a sort of a work, uh, if you, you get, you're used to your colleagues going to work every day, yes. interacting, and if you are sort of isolated, it's not that easy, right? So. I think there are those things, and I try to um, uh, sort of meet with them, uh, smaller groups, whether it's a uh, safety training, whether it's uh, online or, or, or in person. I think those been uh, uh, sort of what different sort of methods we've adapted to. Um, this, above all, is, uh, is sending a positive message to all and talking to people, especially all you can around you, right? I think that's important. So I'm going to take another question here, and this is from Paramji. Uh, I don't have the last name. As Sikh leaders leading businesses in the West, how do you share your Sikh values with your employees? So uh, in our company, we have a very clearly defined uh, core values, um, and uh, the acronym is RIGHT, R-I-G-H-T, uh, and the H in that is humility. Um, I is integrity, T is teamwork, uh, G is being proactive, get going. And uh, so, if we, so if you look at each one of them, that is uh, that has been clearly defined, uh, you know, all of them are actually sick values. Uh, and um, uh, we don't go out and tell everyone these are sick values and that's why we are in, in there. But, you know, as I said earlier, those values are driven by your own personal beliefs and experiences. And uh, and and uh, from once those have been defined, we actually train everyone what that means, and then we actually measure everyone whether you're an associate or you're a principal, where you're a business leader in the company, you get measured on those values, uh, and that's how we have adopted uh, these in our business. So, <laughs> very interesting question, actually, because as uh, Jesse G says. You wouldn't normally say that your values are your Sikhi values because generally in the workplace you don't talk about your faith. But I think you bring the whole of yourself in, and and certainly my, in my person, it's a it's a very large company, um, and within the roles that I play, which which again covers uh, the, the international space, the the way that I've always kind of um, started the journey with people who work for me or with me. Uh, in the interview process, there's usually three hidden questions, and uh, they, they are a test. The first one is a test for integrity. Uh, the second one is usually the, the um, directness of, of the answer, somebody who's going to be honest and direct. So there's integrity, there's honesty. And then I always put in a question around teamwork and partnership and leadership. Tell me what the difference between the three is. Uh, I'm probably giving it away on, on air now that those those are the secret kind of underlying questions. And I think those, as you then develop the conversation with each individual, um, that's usually my underlying theme that I build at a personal level with people I hire. And I think within the broader company, it's been interesting for me because, and I think it's probably why I've been with the current company I'm with for, for as long as I have, uh, I do see the values that I feel comfortable with um, around me in the way that the most of the company operates. You can never say it's 100%, um, but you, you certainly see that those core values are recognized and um, promoted. So that's, that's how I work around it. But Raji? I think for me, uh, the, the message of equality, because uh, uh, growing up, uh, I came to Canada as a 15 a lot of racism and what I faced uh, 
just going through school and early, early part of my career. So I make sure that everybody treated fairly and they're given the opportunity if they have the talent. Uh, I think this is where also Sikh value comes in and uh, treating everybody fair. Manas ki jaat sort of principle, right? So whether you're uh, whatever is your gender, uh, I think you have to give opportunity and um, people need to know that they have opportunity. They, they're not going to be judged. I think those things are uh, important and I've tried to sort of live uh, my professional and business life according to uh, the principles of, of Sikhi that I know I was raised with. I think it's, it's served us uh, well and we you feel satisfied that uh, you're doing the right thing and once in a while you make a decision that you regret and uh, there's nothing wrong or uh, shame in going back and uh, apologizing or relooking at your decisions and uh, I think those uh, sort of uh, good sort of characters uh, that you can develop in your organization that uh, you're sort of um, fair and, and uh, know that organization uh, uh, whether you're Sikh or any other religion that doesn't matter I think the way core principles apply to all and uh, we don't judge people uh, what they are I think that uh, uh, that's how I see things so I'm putting another question, which is an interesting one, and it's from Sandeep Raj. And it's a two part. Do you think Sikh ethics dictates what kind of business, and I would actually even go, what kinds of job or, or you know profession you choose to indulge in? And then the second part of it is, how does being profitable fit into the Sikhi framework of Sikh ethics? Do you think organizations, you know, companies should put a percentage of their profits uh, they are going to earn? They should, they should, be, should there be a cap on the profits they own? Or maybe I would reframe that and say, should there be, uh, should is a difficult word, can there be uh, a formula that corporations adopt that a certain percentage of our profits will go to non-profit. So the first is, do you think sick ethics dictate what kind of business? Second is, is there a, you know, the, the framework and then there's the profits. Anybody would like to go first? <laughs> I'll do all three. <laughs> I think Jasiji and Baradji have the advantage that they run their own company. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think I've, I've obviously picked uh, the company that I'm with at the moment. And in my journey, um, since since I came to the UK, I, I worked for HMRC, the government, then I worked for Pricewaterhouse, a uh, very short stint with um, Nations Bank, and then the rest of my time has been with JP Morgan. And the level at which I've drawn the line for myself, because uh, it is a personal decision. So for me, um, certainly couldn't, couldn't work in... Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to use a really cliched example. I couldn't work in, in a butcher's place where it's clearly an activity that I can't do. I wouldn't work in a narcotics business because I, I certainly couldn't feel like money from, from an organization that, that does what they do. So that's a personal thing. For me, I think it coincides with the key values. A large organization that could actually be involved in some funding, some structures there, but is, is also the employer of 260,000 people right. around the world, creates a lot of employment and a lot of social structure, does put in a huge amount of money into philanthropy. Those things are actually really important to me. So I raise a point around both charitable giving and volunteering and diversity. So. I think one has to choose. Uh, the, the other choice that I made for myself was around an organisation that respected who I am and what I look like. Um, when, and when I came to the UK and started my career, there were some questions of address. And whilst I'm, I'm very comfortable wearing Western dress, I still don't go the, the whole hog. You know, I still tend to like to wear my trousers and tend to wear clothes that I'm comfortable in because I grew up with a culture where we are a little bit more kind of maybe. And, and young ladies don't don't object to my language, but yes, I'm more comfortable in my skin, uh, the way I dress, the way I do. And there were a couple of job offers where there was like, no, there's a uniform and this is what it looks like. And I was like, no, thank you. I don't think I'm comfortable with that. So I think you make a personal decision around mm. that. Um, I think the second part of the question around can we um, force 
you know, society at large to turn profits into non-profit. Uh, I think the, the interesting thing is I think we're at, at a turning point as a society globally. And I think the call for more responsible social re-engineering is out there. I, I live in hope that there is perhaps a more stronger framework of, of better investment into climate change, into ethical farming, into better healthcare. It's, I would like to see it happen. I can see it being quite difficult to force it as it should, but I think the mood music is changing. And I do think more large companies, more more businesses where there is surplus are being looked at with a finer uh, lens. And I'm hoping that uh, social and economic policy around the world is, is really focusing on this a little bit more. So it, it'll happen when enough people want it to happen. So we should certainly be asking for it. Uh, can it happen? It might take time. <laughs> so... Um... So they're both very, uh, actually they're both very good questions. Um, uh, the first part is the, what does uh, what the key uh, kind of guide you and what you do, which is in line or outside of uh, the Sikhi. I think this is the whole definition of who's a Sikh and what are Sikh values. The Sikh is actually, if you believe you're a Sikh, you're a Sikh. And the, the values that you are, uh, I don't think there is a so-called a Sikhi way. I think there are some areas which are black and white. I mean, you know, uh, but that's not a Sikhi thing. There's, there, there, there are things you can do lawfully and things you can do unlawfully. Um, I, I hope none, no Sikh ever gets involved in anything that is unlawful, right? narcotics or any of the other trades, right? But then within the lawful part of it, um, I think this is, a, this is a personal choice. Uh, I actually know of very good Sikhs who... Um, have been involved in the farming of uh, of uh, marijuana, and you know you look at that, and it's a very controversial thing. I mean, you know, marijuana is narcotics and all that. No, actually, that's that's changing. The world of marijuana is changing. I mean, there are a lot more uh, things that you can do with marijuana outside of the narcotics part of it, um, which is uh, which is very variable. And actually, and these six get looked down upon by the community and saying, "Wait a second, this guy is in the farming of marijuana." Well. You, you haven't really peeled the onion. I think this is a personal choice. Um, the second part of in terms of actually should the should there be a cap or should there be a minimum for the large corporations to pay towards the social? I and, and this is where I would like to bring my own personal bias. Um, uh, the answer is no. Uh, I think the uh, the uh, I, I I most of the uh, the goodness when it comes down to charity in the world is actually driven by people, person, personal donations rather than corporation donations. Um, I, and I think this is where I draw the distinction. Um, uh, and this is a part of the reason why in our uh, in the Sikhi culture, you know, they don't say to go out and actually, you know, uh, leave everything, leave your family, leave your business, go meditate. Uh, you know, uh, we are actually taught to be the productive members of the society, whatever, whatever society and community you choose to be part of. Uh, but actually do it, do, do the right things. Uh, you know, uh, and we talked about a lot of those things that we actually uh, as sex uh, uh, do in our lives. Uh, but on the personal side of it, uh, look, uh, there, there is a very clear kind of a precedence that has been set and that is called the swan. Um, and, uh, you know, and uh, if if every sick, uh, no matter what your means are and no matter what your excuses are, was to actually uh, stick to the dasan part of it, I think we would become a much better, more productive citizens of the world and the communities that we live in. Rachi, any thoughts on that? Yes, I, I think this is um, more of a personal thing, but I, uh, you probably know or may not know that in Vancouver there's a big uh, opioid crisis. More people have died. Uh, uh, because of that, then, then even COVID. And also in the South Asia, especially in the Sikh community, uh, more than 100 people have given up the, the, the sort of lives in uh, sort of gang wars and whatever, all of them related to power and drugs and whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So when um, some Sikh members are just for, I think it's a pure 
opportunism that they chose to invest or they lead companies that are marijuana or a drug or whatever. Because we are leading by example. Other community judges us or sees how, what we do. I think personally, I, I don't promote businesses. I've had several opportunities, even my real estate side, people want to open some sort of a, uh, clinic or dispensing uh, along those narcotics and uh, I uh, I don't encourage people around me there's so, so many other businesses that you can do because especially uh, the problems we have we need to uh, fix that and if we discourage that kind of lifestyle power and whatever and promote humility part of the problem is quick money people see it does have effect and you get judged all of us in other other businesses how our youth is behaving, it all falls on, on the parents. They are saying you're not raising well and our resources, police and whatever is going into uh, monitoring our, our, your community, right? So I think those things are important, what kind of businesses we, we select. And then adding uh, the, the philanthropy part, it doesn't have to be or the percentage of the swan. Charity begins at home. If, if your own staff or your family you're not treating and you're robbing people and then you're giving for publicity a few dollars to um, a religious or other institution, that, uh, what, what good is that, right? So if there's, uh, but definitely reasonable amount of profit is necessary for any organization to sustain uh, their operations. But whenever you can, you should give back uh, whatever you can. If, if we don't do it, who will, right? So if you can afford to, certainly whether percentage is uh, uh, more or less, it's it's uh, it's, it's uh, depends on your sort of capacity, right? But uh, I think if if you do um, uh, start some of that, uh, like I I used to have a matching, but I do it on behalf of the whole organization. People feel good, right? I mean, everybody wants to do something positive for their. Uh, um, sort of neighborhood and society, right? So uh, I think those things are important. So that leads me because, you know, the three of you have been incredible supporters of SECRI. Um, you know, and that's why I have gotten to know you over the years. You are extremely busy, all three of you. Um, you have choices. You have, you can choose to give to other organizations, which I know you do as well. And, you know, you talk about it. But why have you, but a significant amount of your resources, I know, also know, comes to SICRI. So if you could just share with us as to what has motivated you, and I want to use the word carefully, uh, how, what has motivated you to invest in the programs at SICRI? What is that one thing or the two things that you have found it to be valuable for you to spend your time and your resources to building this organization. I, I know both of you, uh, just as you, you serve, uh, you know, in the capacity, you are our chair. Paramjit, you are on our advisory council. Balraji, I know you are a tremendous supporter and a funder of SICRI, besides the other, um, and also all three of you. So share, share with me, share with our readers, what is, uh, listeners, what is it that has motivated you? I think for me, the fact that Sikri brings the world of Shabd to a very broad spectrum. I think as an educational organization, the amount of content that is created, the initiatives uh, that have been ongoing and growing, and I have to compliment you here. I know I said I wouldn't do anything personal, but I think there is a lot of creative content that is being put out. And so one of the challenges we have within Sikhi is if you if you don't have a natural way of learning Gurbani or learning the message that the, the huge legacy that, that our gurus have given us in the form of Shabbat, then how do we tap into that? And I do think Sikri's work around uh, and the latest Guru Granth Sahib translation project is an example of the ambition of the programs but also the curriculums for kids. Um, uh, you know, it's 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 been a sustained effort over many years, and I think the investment is not short term. It's a long term uh, thinking about how doesn't matter which language where we're sitting, bringing people on that journey because Sikhi is a journey, and you've got to start learning. And what you provide is such a big platform for that. So, right. yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no go ahead. 
بالراديو um, I, uh, I think for me uh, it was the refreshing I attended a uh, sort of uh, I think convention a couple of years ago in Chicago I think this is a uh, my wife and I, when we attended, because we don't look like six and a lot of people in our community would say, you, you don't even belong in this organization. But I think the welcoming that we got from, uh, from the organization and also talking to Harinder Singh, and I could see whenever I would ask him question or listen to him, I could see, yeah, I'm a part of this. I'm uh, as much sick or, uh, or whoever wears uh, um, uh, the star or, or not, right? So I think if you're sick at heart, you follow Sikhi in your daily living, and uh, that maybe we are on uh, a path of Sikhi along, uh, right? So different sort of uh, uh, stages. I think that that for me was the attraction, and also just raised in a village um, household and farming, and you do certain thing, you do a kind of part, and then we would do the same here in. Um, in Vancouver, every time we finish up a development project, we would do a kind part and you do the longer and could serve and whatever. Then after a while, it became nobody was interested in coming and you sort of donate certain amount of money to Gurdwara. Then we thought, you know what, this is an organization for me that uh, this is a we need to preserve our history and educate people with the, with the right uh, sort of knowledge and uh, technical know-how and those things are important i think to to for our uh, um uh, panth or, or our sort of the whole sikhi right so what the, the work that sikhi is doing is sort of i can relate to that i feel it's important i don't know too much about it because i'm just a very elementary stages of sikhi but uh, i i i feel this is something i should do and i uh, I sort of believe in, in the, the whole cause. I think that's where my connection to Sikhi is. Hopefully, as I sort of have more time in, in my hand and I can cr- contribute more in, in the future years. And uh, this is uh, sort of my two bits worth. So, so you know, I, I, I have been uh, uh, benefiting from Sikhi for over 10 years now. Um, and um, you know, when I, if I zoom out uh, for for my wife and I, our our passion is education and entrepreneurship. Actually, almost everything that we support, everything, is centered on either education or entrepreneurship. Because uh, we very strongly believe that actually, if there are more people who are educated and more people who are entrepreneurs, this world be, will be this world will be a much better place to live in than we currently live in. Uh, so that's kind of driven by the kind of the big broad vision and strategy behind what we do and what we choose to devote our resources and our time to um and why sikri it's for two very selfish reasons uh and it's uh the first one is the personal uh, selfish reason um i i you know i was born in a sikh family grew up in amritsar all you know all of that and um i what i realized is that uh, you know my own understanding about the uh, the message of gurus was uh, was very very weak, and what I could actually learn in just one day or one session of Sikri was probably more what than what I had learned in the first 40 years of my life when I got involved with it. Uh, and that when you look at the kind of the impact and the outcome, and then since then, uh, you know, uh, it makes I think Sikri makes it easier for non-experts to understand the message of uh, uh, of guru. Uh, which uh, unfortunately or fortunately has not been easily accessible uh, through other channels, primarily which has been um, uh, Gurdwaras. The the second selfish reason was that, uh, you know, living in the West and growing up in the West, um, uh, you know, our kids are, 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 are very worldly aware and very astute. And, you know, we now become, we're in a generation where our kids are, you know, they treat us as equals and we treat them as equals. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, they asked some very hard questions, and both my wife and I didn't feel equipped to entertain the conversation with our kids uh, around that. And what we have found is again uh, the resources that Sikri puts out is actually makes it easier for both us and our kids to actually understand um, what we can actually learn from the message of the guru. So those two very simple. So one is for our own personal development, and the second one was to uh, for the development of our kids. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much for, you know, very thoughts, but this is what we bring back to the team. And uh, it's also good for us to 
I mean, it's not like a bravo to it, but it's good to know that the work that is flowing from SICRI, you know, is being consumed and is affecting people's lives. And Paramjit, you mentioned the children's curriculum. Thank you. That, that SICRI invests a lot in that curriculum. And now with the Guru Granth Sahib project, which we have um, undertaken, it is quite the journey. So we come to the end of this wonderful 90 minutes and uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and to be with our audience. And I think at, at this point, Manvinder, would you like to come in and do the closing? Yes, yes. definitely. Oh, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, I hear you. Echo, um, apologies for that. Um, Lovely. Yeah. Thank you to everyone. Again, echoing what Amy G has just said um, for this insightful conversation. Uh, as someone who didn't really expect to be absorbed by this conversation, I definitely was. It's different than our usual programming. Um, I think based on the on the chat, the Q&A, the abundance of questions we got, the audience was equally, uh, if not more engaged. So thank you again. And as always, a recording of this webinar will be available within 24 hours. Just to wrap up today's conversation, I would like to remind everyone that we host bi-weekly live webinars. Our next webinar is actually this coming Saturday, so just a week from today, on October 3rd, with Harinder Singh and Jocelyn Gore to, dis to discuss Sick Research Institute's sixth report in the State of the Bunt series, titled Sikhi and Sexuality, exploring how Sikhi has influenced the collective behavior of the six when it comes to sex, pleasure, and procreation. And lastly, don't forget to tune into The Sick Cast, a podcast produced by Sikri, where we explore the various issues and events affecting six worldwide. Thank you for joining in. Today's webinar will be ending now. Vagrujika Kalsa, Vagrujiki Fateh.